<laughs> you're such a big dreamer. <laughs> I am Vuyo and I believe everyone is a dreamer. And as big, big dreamers, we never lose. We either win or learn. Without wasting any time, let's start learning. The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. Timeless Lessons on Wealth, Greed, and Happiness. Chapter 1. No One's Crazy. In this chapter, Housel highlights the diversity of people's financial behaviors and decisions, emphasizing that no one is inherently crazy when it comes to money. He points out that individuals come from different backgrounds, generations, and circumstances which shape their financial beliefs and actions. These experiences are more significant than second-hand knowledge. As a result, people hold varying views on how money works, and what appears irrational to one person might be entirely reasonable to another. This perspective encourages empathy and understanding of different financial choices and behaviors. Let me also take this time to explain the Great Depression to which Housel mentions a lot in this chapter. It was marked by a significant decline in economic activity, massive unemployment, bank failures, a steep drop in industrial production, and a deflationary spiral. The stock market crash of 1929 is often seen as the initial trigger, but various factors, including banking crises, trade imbalances, and a lack of government intervention, exacerbated the crisis. The Great Depression resulted in widespread suffering and hardship for millions of people and had a profound impact on economic and social policies, leading to the implementation of various New Deal programs and increased government regulation to prevent such a catastrophe from happening again. Different Experiences the way an individual who grew up in poverty contemplates risk and reward is fundamentally distinct from the perspective of a child raised in a wealthy banking family, even if the latter made a sincere effort to understand it. Someone who experienced their formative years during a period of high inflation went through something entirely different from the individual who grew up in an era of stable prices. The stockbroker who suffered the loss of everything during the Great Depression endured an ordeal beyond the imagination of the tech worker who enjoyed the prosperity of the late 1990s. This list of distinct life experiences goes on without end. You possess knowledge about financial matters that I lack, and vice versa. We navigate life with different beliefs, objectives, and outlooks, not because one of us is more intelligent or possesses superior information. Instead, our distinct and equally compelling life experiences have shaped us differently. John F. Kennedy in his book about 1930s America, Frederick Lewis Allen wrote that the Great Depression had a profound and lasting impact on millions of Americans. However, people had a wide range of experiences during that time. Twenty-five years later, when John F. Kennedy was running for president, he was asked about his memories of the Depression. He mentioned that he had no first-hand experience because his family was extremely wealthy, and their fortune had actually grown during that period. His exposure to the Depression was limited to his father hiring extra gardeners to provide jobs for those in need. He admitted that he didn't truly grasp the effects of the Depression until he studied it at Harvard. This became a significant point of discussion during the 1960 election, as people questioned how someone with no personal understanding of such a major economic event could be entrusted with the responsibility of managing the economy. Kennedy's military service in World War II helped offset this concern as it was another widespread emotional experience of the previous generation that his primary opponent, Hubert Humphrey, lacked. The challenge we face is that no amount of research or open-mindedness can fully replicate the intensity of fear and uncertainty. While we can read about the Great Depression and its impact on people's lives, we lack the emotional scars of those who actually lived through it. Conversely, those who lived through it might find it difficult to relate to someone like us, who appear complacent about things like investing in stocks. Our perspectives are shaped by our individual experiences. Spreadsheets can provide data on the historical frequency of significant stock market declines, but they can't capture the deep emotions of returning home, looking at one's children, and wondering if a decision will affect their lives. Studying history gives us a sense of understanding. But until we've personally lived through and felt the consequences of a situation, we may not truly comprehend it enough to alter our behavior. In essence, we all believe we have a grasp on how the world functions, but our understanding is based on a limited slice of life experiences. As investor Michael Batnick says, some lessons have to be experienced before they can be understood. We are all victims, in different ways, to that truth. What Americans Do With Their Money In 2006, economists Ulrich Malmendier and Stefan Nagel, affiliated with the National Bureau of Economic Research, conducted an extensive analysis spanning 50 years of the Survey of Consumer Finances, which offers a detailed view of Americans' financial behaviors. However, this isn't how most people operate. 
The economists uncovered that individuals' investment choices throughout their lives are heavily influenced by the economic experiences of their own generation, particularly those experiences they encountered in their early adulthood. For example, if someone came of age during a period of high inflation, they were more likely to allocate a smaller portion of their money into bonds later in life compared to those who grew up in a low inflation era. Similarly, if one's formative years coincided with a strong stock market, they were inclined to invest a larger portion of their money in stocks as they matured, in contrast to those who grew up during weak stock market conditions. The economists concluded that our findings suggest that individual investors' willingness to bear risk depends on personal history. This means that it's not necessarily a person's intelligence, education, or financial sophistication that primarily shapes their investment decisions. Rather, it's the fortuitous circumstances of when and where they were born that have a significant impact. No one should. There are different groups all around the world. Or the stock market. Or unemployment. Or money in general. No one should expect them to respond to financial information the same way. No one should assume they are influenced by the same incentives. No one should expect them to trust the same sources of advice. No one should expect them to agree on what matters, what's worth it, what's likely to happen next, and what the best path forward is. Their view of money was formed in different worlds. And when that's the case, a view about money that one group of people thinks is outrageous can make perfect sense to another. These individuals, having grown up in diverse circumstances, are likely to have distinct perspectives on matters like inflation, the stock market, unemployment, and finances in general. Consequently, it is unreasonable to anticipate uniform responses to financial information from them. It is also unwise to assume they are equally influenced by the same incentives or to expect them to place trust in identical sources of advice. Moreover, one should not anticipate a consensus among them regarding what is of significance, what is worth pursuing, what is likely to unfold in the future, and the most prudent course of action. Their respective outlooks on money were shaped by entirely different environments and experiences. Therefore, when confronted with differing views on financial matters, it is essential to recognize that what one group may find outrageous, another may perceive as entirely sensible. Nephew of a Chinese Worker A few years ago, the New York Times published a story about the harsh working conditions at Foxconn, a major Taiwanese electronics manufacturer, which understandably upset many readers. The comment says, open quotes, My aunt worked several years in what Americans call sweatshops, Long hours, small wage, poor working conditions. Do you know what my aunt did before she worked in one of these factories? It was hard work. She was a prostitute. The idea of working in a sweatshop compared to that old lifestyle is improvement, in my opinion. That is why I am upset by many Americans thinking. Our governmental infrastructure is different. The country is different. Yes, factory is hard labor. Could it be better? Yes, but only when you compare such to American jobs. Close quotes the comment ended like that. Housel then goes on to say he doesn't know what to make of this. Part of him wants to argue passionately, and another part craves understanding. However, primarily, it's an example of how different experiences can result in vastly different viewpoints on subjects that one side intuitively thinks should be black and white. Lottery tickets. These individuals may be misinformed, possessing complete information lack mathematical proficiency, be influenced by manipulative marketing, or simply not know what they're doing. They may also miscalculate the consequences of their actions. However, every financial choice they make aligns with their current perspective and fulfills the criteria they believe are important. They construct a narrative about their actions and the reasons behind them a narrative molded by their personal life experiences. For instance, consider the case of purchasing lottery tickets. Americans collectively spend more on lottery tickets than on movies, video games, music, sporting events, and books combined. Who buys these tickets? Primarily individuals with lower incomes. On average, the lowest income households in the U.S. spend $412 annually on lotto tickets, four times more than those in the highest income brackets. It's worth noting that 40% of Americans cannot come up with $400 in an emergency. Therefore, those spending $400 on lottery tickets are generally the same people who admit they couldn't cover a $400 emergency expense. They are essentially using their safety nets for a one in millions chance of striking it rich. This behavior may appear irrational, both to the writer and the reader, but it can be understood from the perspective of low-income lottery ticket buyers. Their reasoning might go something like this. They live paycheck to paycheck, savings appear unattainable, opportunities for significantly higher wages are distant. 
and they cannot afford luxuries such as vacations, new cars, health insurance, or homes in safe neighborhoods. Providing their children with a college education seems impossible without incurring substantial debt. Many of the possessions and opportunities that those who read financial books already have or are likely to achieve are beyond their reach. Buying a lottery ticket is the only time they can grasp a tangible dream of attaining the comforts that others take for granted. They are essentially paying for a dream. And this may be challenging for those who are already living such a dream to comprehend. That's why they purchase more lottery tickets than others. One doesn't necessarily have to endorse this reasoning, as purchasing lottery tickets when financially strained is still an imprudent choice. However, it is feasible to empathize with why lottery ticket sales persist. The idea that what you're doing may seem irrational, but I can somewhat grasp why you're doing it underpins the foundation of many of our financial decisions. Few people make financial choices purely based on numerical calculations. Instead, they make them in settings like the dinner table or a business meeting, where personal history, individual worldviews, ego, pride, marketing, and peculiar incentives merge to form a narrative that makes sense to them. Emotions over facts The influence of emotion over facts in financial matters presents a significant challenge. It helps clarify why we often deviate from what we are advised to do with money. People tend to make unconventional financial decisions because we are all relatively inexperienced in this domain, and what may appear irrational to one person might appear logical to another. It's important to note that no one is truly irrational. We all base our decisions on our individual life experiences, which make sense to us at a particular moment. This is the end of Chapter 1 Summary. Stay on the lookout for Chapter 2. Please don't forget to like, share, comment and subscribe for more content like this.